Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Daily Hi-Fi Podcast. We do this every Monday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. My name is Chana. With me, as always, we've got Joe. And today, our special guest, Wilfried Van Balen, um, inventor of Oro 3D, you know? Um, what's going on? Hey. Hello, <laughs> Chana and Joe and all the people watching. So thank you very much for being with us. I'm very uh, pleased as well that you invited me for this call. I I've seen a few things from you. It was very interesting to see all your comments about what I was hearing sometimes on programs. So any kind of questions you have, so um, I'm ready for you. You're re oh, he's he's ready. Oh, he's ready. I you asked him right guy? before this. You ready for any and all questions? He said, yeah, bring it. I think so. <laughs> no problem. And it's 1 a.m. over there, so thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us from Europe. Yeah, I'm looking perhaps a little bit sleepy, but it's already... <laughs> it is early in the morning, or like late at night. But I'm used to, you know, in the music industry, I'm a producer, record producer myself, engineer. Yeah, so um, that's the way it all started many years ago. Then I built a famous complex, yeah, Galaxy Studios, and uh, well, let's say music is in our DNA. Yeah, and right. this, um, let's say perhaps that's what I can present a little bit. Yeah, uh, what we do. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, hear more, feel more is a slogan that I used uh, all the time because it's about sound, of course, yeah. And uh, Galaxy Studios, uh, let's say Auto Technologies was, uh, is a kind of a spin-off from the famous Galaxy Studios, which I uh, built many years ago. This uh, is, an, let's say, a very known uh, studio worldwide, yeah. Um, it'll give me some insights about it. So this is the complex. So it's about uh, 17 meters, which is about 300 feet, yeah, by 150 feet, yeah. It's three stages high, three floors high. Those are the most silent recording studios on the planet, yeah. Uh, it's a world record, more than 100 dB isolation between each room. So there's like 15 bunkers, yeah, standing on metal springs, yeah. The resonance frequency from each uh, studio is less than 3 hertz. And these were the first ever studios built for 5.1 and 7.1 control rooms already in the 90s. Yeah, um, Here I built as well the first ever commercial studios for immersive sound. Uh, the first one was opened in 2010 already. Yeah, uh, In 2011, I mixed there for George Lucas the movie Red Tails, which was the first ever movie in history uh, for immersive sound. And this, was, I've had this whole famous complex is as well the headquarters. For our technologies, so the Auro 3D format, yeah. But to give you a few pictures inside, this is the famous Galaxy Hall, yeah. Uh, we can host there an orchestra till about 60, 70 people, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. The background noise of the hall is less than 14 dB, yeah. Wow. Air That's pretty on, quiet. Yeah. Airco on, all light on. So you can just with a musical microphone, you can just not even pick up, uh, let's say, the kind of noise from the airco. Yeah? So the airco can stay on all the time you are recording and you do not hear anything about it. And do you see my mouse here? You Here you see the yeah. microphone set up for the Auto 3D. Yeah? You see this is a left, center, right, left, center, right, round. And we just mm -hmm. put up here this front height and back height. That's all what we do. Yeah? So it is that simple. Yeah? It's a very easy way of recording. Um, this was then the first ever 5.1 studio with an API console. Already in 96, yeah. Then we have as well the first ever 7.1 mastering studio. And then I was wondering in 2004, 5, from what is next, because with 7.1, I was st still missing something. There was still something very, let's say, unnatural or artificial. Let's say when we when you hear music and you, you reproduce it, yeah, it's not at all the same. And then I came to the idea, I saw the idea about already in the past about adding height. And in 2005, I started to experiment with it. And that's the moment I came to this other 3D format. And I was shocked about the emotional experience when you do it in a certain way. And it was not always working in every direction. So I was doing a lot of research in 2005 about speaker layouts, about the coherence of sounds, and that's the way that I started to develop the format. Yeah? Galaxy Studio is not only uh, a sound, it is all of these pictures. Yeah? So in 2006, I extended the company together with my brother. I built up the company with my brother Guy. Yeah? And uh, we extended the whole thing with a uh, post, uh, post facility as well for 4K digital intermediate workflow. Yeah? So 4K was already in 2006. 
at Galaxy Studios. Yeah. Now, what I found is when you hear more, you feel more. That's like a very emotional subconscious experience. Fair audio is, of course, let's say it's it's uh, yeah it's the first fair our hearing sense is the only sense that we develop before we are born yeah it's very deep in our system and all the other senses are really developing further when we are born yeah the hearing sense is the only one which we cannot stop we cannot just close it yeah our eyes or whatever you can just the other senses you can you can control it much better yeah your hearing sense even if you sleep, yeah, it's always there. Yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I found is, let's say, the moment when you come to a close real life experience in your reproduction, it gives that immersive experience. Yeah, and yeah, that was one of the first things I was thinking about. Let's say, okay, good, immersive. Yeah, what let's say because we we talk now about immersive sound. Yeah, but do you have any idea about the background of it, how it came? Yeah. So what I found in 2005 is that we we are missing, in fact, the um, a kind of new term to to that describes 3D sound. Yeah? In the beginning, I was calling it like true 3D sound, and people reacted from, oh, but I have already true 3D sound at home. Yeah, and I said, no, that I, that's almost impossible. Yeah, and I said, yeah, but I have surround sound, and surround sound is 3D. And I said, no, it's not really true. It's in fact a two-dimensional reproduction format. The speakers are just in a horizontal plane around you, yeah. And um, then, yeah, people started to call it so many different things. You, they started like spatial sound, and they started, but spatial sound is used in stereo as well, or like in other formats, or like periphonic sound, like uh, true 3D sound, like surround sound plus height was then used in audio engineering society. So finally, I thought, okay, we have to, to come to a new term that's used for, let's say, this 3D experience. Yeah? And just because of the, the feedback I got from a lot of people, from, wow, this sounds really immersive. Yeah? I found immersive sound is, in fact, what we need to have as a new term. Yeah? And I introduced that idea in the Audio Engineering Society in Tokyo in 2010 already. Yeah. Um, the moment when I launched uh, Auto3D, by the way, in that same convention, yeah, and it is all about adding the missing dimension in sound reproduction, yeah. So this is an, let's say, an, the reproduction of a 3D space is in fact what well, the idea is behind it, yeah. But let's say I've seen afterwards, let's say they're coming formats on the market which only two height speakers. Of course, you have the X, Y, Z axis only with two height speakers as well. But the point is that with two height speakers only, you cannot reproduce the 3D space, for which you need at least, let's say, four height speakers, or let's say, like a cube around you. Yeah? And in fact, that's, um, that's the idea. So let's say this is a little introduction, and I think an important topic that I would like to discuss before, let's say, before going on, perhaps we can already ask questions. I don't know how it works, or the questions now, or let's say at the end of the show. Yeah, you just uh, keep, you just going, keep because going because if we, we, we start, start answering, answering questions. questions. Oh, oh. Okay, good. So um, let's say what I see very often is the confusion already from immersive sound, which is related to channel and object-based technology. Yeah, And another topic what I see very often is a kind of a misunderstanding of what it means, channel and object-based technology. Yeah? That has to do, of course, with the marketing from companies who are, let's say, trying to sell such technology. Yeah? Um, and let's say I can give you an, like an insight, yeah, how is the a moment, this is about auto, I have another thing, let me go, ah, do you, a moment, I'm going to take now another show, can I just stop this, yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah stop it and then, and you I know, you do the same thing again, share, share screen, and then pick the new um, window. Okay, I think it is this one. And while he's doing that, yeah, you know, if you guys want to, um, you know, ask some questions, um, go ahead and we'll try to try to okay. do that, add them in at some point in time. Um, so I will try now to, let's say, to explain a little bit more in depth what the real difference is. Yeah, because I know very simply said, it is like um, channel based means then, OK, just like the normal uh data you are going to put in a kind of a specific channel with a reproduction idea about it yeah and with uh, object based it's the same kind of 
let's say, audio information, but there's metadata on top of that, yeah? That's the easy way to say it. But let's say, let's go a little bit deeper into what it means, yeah? So in channel-based, we typically, I give you an example, in a movie or like even in music, yeah, you have objects. And objects can be this kind of an, an essence, this kind of a source. It can be a microphone, it can be a synthesized sound, it can be guitar sound, it can be, let's say these are objects in, in, in movies, this can be all kinds of sounds, the dialogue or like certain things, let's say, which are added afterwards, yeah. These are objects, yeah. And what you're going to do is you add some metadata on it, yeah. And the metadata, for instance, it can be panning, so where that object is, uh, um, where the volume of that object is, all this kind of stuff, yeah, or things that you do that you are going to add during a mixing, yeah. And what you do is typically you mix it, yeah, and the mixing rendering, which is typically done in your console then, yeah, for analog or digital doesn't mean uh, matter, yeah. Typically what you use in channel-based configuration is a kind of a speaker layout. And you can have a few speaker layouts that you can select at the same time. Yeah, you can do your mix in 5.1 or let's say or 9.1. You can check how the compatibility is with stereo and things like that. But you prepare all this mixing, let's say, versus a channel based con uh, speaker configuration. And the nice thing about channel based is that those speaker configurations typically are like as a standard in the market. Yeah. If I talk about stereo or 5.1 or 9.1, these are standards in ITU everywhere. So everybody knows a little bit the same kind of speaker location because the moment when you start to change those locations, yeah, you make different artistic choices. And that's the point. I think one of the most important things is the, uh, let's say, the respect to the artistic intent. The artistic integrity is very important. And that's much easier to be achieved with channel-based sound compared to object-based sound. I come later to this point, yeah? Anyway, so this is when your mix is ready. And then an important thing what happens is in a channel-based sound is the mastering. Is this, mastering, for instance, is very important in pop music, yeah? Um, and what is mastering? Typically, when the master is ready, this comes from, let's say, the analog times, yeah? That kind of tape, yeah, nobody was having such a tape recorder at home and it has to go to a reproduction chain. So what typically happens is, of course, uh, the vinyl cut in this was the mastering. But the mastering is the last moment that you can really touch the sound, yeah. Of course, let's, let's say mastering has a kind of a technical component. It's preparing the master, which goes then to the reproduction of a factory, yeah. Um, but it is the last time you can change and tweak the sounds. Now, what we have seen over the years in the 70s, they were like engineers who really were so creative, they could easily enhance the, let's say, the way the sound is coming out of the speakers, yeah, or on headphones, doesn't matter, yeah, when they was were doing like certain, let's say, blendings with compression techniques and things like that, yeah, that was one thing. So they could optimize the way the sound was coming out of the speakers, yeah, combined with, um, let's say, a better uh, entire, uh, how do you call it? You create an entity of an album. Yeah, you know, if you have, if you create an album, you don't mix everything uh, in 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 one week or something. Sometimes you have like a sound of let's say a, a title coming from one studio, another title coming from another studio from an engineer. Yeah, and if you play this back after each other, yeah, then the volume was completely different. The EQ, right, there was like right. You want you want to like kind of make it all one cohesive thing, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was right. the word I was looking for. <laughs> I'm not native English and you hear that, of course. Yeah. So, but that cohe the cohesive feeling is very important. Yeah. And as well, the point was at the end, let's say those uh, mastering uh, engineers, they really can tweak the sound to a very nice thing to me, to me create more of a glossy feel. And in pop music, it's really very important. It's less used in classical music. Yeah. But especially in pop music is a lot is important, yeah. Now, to give you an idea, with object-based technology, there is no mastering process. Just you know that. They can do it, but it's very complex and it's a very complex to, uh, like workaround. And it will not, it is not able, let's say, to do the same kind of things that you are used to do in a traditional mastering process. Yeah. So that makes R3D the only format who can do, let's say, the full workflow in the channel-based workflow. 
and it is not because Auto 3D is only channel based. No, we have a possibility to work in channel based only. We have object based technology as well. I come later to that point. Yeah. So finally, what happens then is okay. Then uh, when the distribution is in heaven, the idea is that the, uh, the consumer at playback hears at playback in his channel based selection. It can be then or whatever on the blue, it is stereo 5.1, that he hears it in the same way as artistically meant to be let's say of let's say how it was the idea of about the artistic intent behind that uh, production here yeah so this is let's say a typically channel based production chain yeah which is standard for Auto 3d surround sound and stereo production yeah and as i told you so this is let's say that's the reason why in immersive sound Auto 3d is the only immersive sound format that can deliver as well that mastering process now let's jump now but if, if, if this is clear for everybody, I would like to jump now to object-based production. Yeah? What is an object-based production chain? We start again from the same objects. Yeah? We add as well the same metadata uh, as we do normally in channel-based. The difference is that, let's say, going to the distribution, this is going to be used instead of mixing it versus a speaker layout here. Of course, you do it in a certain way, but you put everything in an object-based data stream. So you, you have all these objects with this metadata and this metadata is known in the distribution chain. And then at the rendering at playback, which is going to be done versus a certain speaker layout. I give you now again an example. If you have like a certain, yeah, like a bird or something here or there, yeah, um, uh, in, in the, let's say, in the 3D atmosphere, you can say, okay, that sound has to position there. And you add that metadata. And the big misunderstanding from a lot of people now is they believe due to the fact that you have this metadata that you can more precisely, let's say, have the reproduction of that sound. And that's not true. Of course, the metadata can describe it perfectly, but that's not the way that, let's say, that human beings are hearing. Yeah? Um, a lot of people, they don't realize, but we cannot position sounds vertically positioned exactly above each other. So if you're like, if you're like position the sounds with the metadata in between it, yeah, people might think, oh, in the vertical axis, we can have the kind of same phantom image like we have in a horizontal axis. And that's not true. Our hearing is horizontally oriented. Yeah. And we yeah. can, in the horizontal axis, you know, from left to right, if you have, let's say, Two speakers you can position sounds yeah wherever you want between those speakers and our brain feels like it picks it up let's say that's the reason why we call it a phantom image it's not really there but you can have a sound coming from a place where there's no speaker right this doesn't work in the vertical axis and i remember when i was doing in the beginning some tests i wanted to to, to create movements in the vertical axis and i was Jesus, why why don't I hear this vertical movements? I, I do panning it right and I saw on my metering system, I really want, I have to hear them there, but I hear them like to, to the closest speaker. Yeah? And it was more by coincidence when I was doing this with my head. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. And then I heard the position where I thought it was. Yeah, But when I put my head like that, I didn't hear it. So that, what, what is that going on? So in the beginning, I thought, oh, perhaps my angle is not big enough. And when I was raising my angle very wide up, yeah, then I had another problem coming. Then suddenly the sound was not coherent anymore. Even I was taking it from, let's say, two microphones in my recording hall, which I have, let's say, a coherence in, uh, in, in, in between. The moment when I reproduced it with an angle which was more, let's say, like 40 degrees or something, the, the, the sound started to fall apart. I heard like two different sources not connected. When I do this with my head, suddenly they were connected again. And that was something which for me like, I was shocked about that because I start to understand immediately that all kinds of things that we learn to use in the horizontal axis doesn't work in the vertical axis. Yeah? And this coherence is a very important thing. So if you think with object-based technology that you can position sounds wherever you want, that's absolutely not true. Yeah, I can tell you the most important things for three-dimensional sound to have, let's say, that natural feel are the 3D reflections around each source. And believe it or not, but all these objects are just monophiles. 
that you can have let's say um, you can let's say put it like that it has not to be a mono yeah it an object can be have let's say more channels at the same time but the way this is being used by our competitors yeah is typically let's say just mono sounds so they don't contain the important 3d reflections yeah and those three reflections are the most important or key let's say for human beings to hear a natural three-dimensional sound and Very that's interesting. what is uh, what is uh, let's say what these things cannot be uh, reproducing what they say now very easy is oh yeah but we can add this in our channel-based environment because let's say for instance like Dolby Atmos yeah they have a channel-based part and an object-based part I come later to this whole stuff so they say we can put in our channel-based part the reflections but then you lose the time coherence between that object where it will be placed and of course let's say the rest of the reflections and if your channel-based system cannot reproduce a space, then it means you cannot rec recreate the space thing. Then you have to use your object-based system to say, okay, there are the, the places where we, I would like to have those reflections. But due to the fact, and now I'm coming here to the fact that the speaker layout is a little bit more flexible, yeah, that creates, of course, let's say this... Um, this very in, in predictable, how do you call it? It's unpredictable. Yeah? It's not so predictable uh, effect, that effect. Effect is not the right word. Yeah? The result. So it delivers a more unpredictable result for the creative creators because you do not know what kind of speaker layouts they're going that to the use. end user has, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's say these are typically reproduction chains. Now they are an object reproduction chain, but there are not that many uh, object-based reproduction chains, yeah? So, uh, ISONO is one of them, Wavefield synthesis was used for them, but let's say this is not so known. What we know in the meantime is the following. It's a hybrid production chain. And in fact, well, when we talk about formats, yeah, uh, like Atmos or DTSX, yeah, we, they all these are object based, yeah. They add an object based layer, but in fact, they have as well a combination of a channel based, yeah. They typically have a channel based part, yeah. For instance, in Dolby Atmos, they have a 7.1 uh, for the consumer format, yeah. It's a 7.1 format, yeah. And they use object based technology to add height, yeah. Um, and they have as well, let's say, this kind of uh, this is then the workflow uh, you see here yeah so we have the, the same thing channel based and object based are com combined they come into that kind of uh, object based data stream yeah and then they have let's say a kind of flexibility as well this is going to be rendered yeah a flexibility i mean from the speaker layout yeah and that's in fact the concept behind it yeah but what we see what we see is if you have enough speakers, yeah, you you can do much more with it, yeah. So that's what we do as well with our Max, yeah. Our Max is already existing since 2012, yeah. So we have already object-based technology before even Dolby was uh, uh, coming out to the market with that concept. Object-based technology is not invented by Dolby at all. It already exists from the end of the 80s, where it was discussed in broadcast. And I think that it makes a lot of sense because. To add metadata, you can do certain things in broadcast, which is very interesting for the consumer, yeah? like uh, interactivity, like the fact that you can control yourself, perhaps the dialogue, or change the dialogue to a different kind of uh, language, yeah? which is in the same, let's say, container being developed. Yeah? And that idea about object-based technology, I like a lot. Yeah? Uh, or if you have really enough speakers, yeah, like for instance, in the cinema environment. And that's the way that, for instance, Dolby Atmos was created. I remember that they, in the beginning, they said this is only for cinema, it's created for cinema. Well, this is not meant for the consumer. Uh, but let's say that that idea is, in fact, that makes sense because then you have a lot of channels already. By the way, uh, Dolby Atmos has their two more channels compared to the home system, which is creating already like not that same compatibility here. Yeah? um in our technologies we keep the same channel based environment yeah? so we go up till our 13.1 in our speaker format yeah? but with our max we have as well the addition of let's say 128 objects that we can deliver at the 
same time as well to let's say to uh, to the whole chain yeah and that is creating of course that normal three-dimensional sound that we have that consumers will hear yeah and sometimes people think that oh so okay i can hear more immersive sound when i hear it in the cinema environment yeah i think it's not true yeah the more the point is if you have like for instance the home let's say 10 11 12 speakers yeah then you have that full immersive sound experience yeah just to add a little bit more transparency of let's say where the objects are being placed you have to add a lot of extra speakers does it make the sound more immersive no not really the only thing is we're getting a little bit of uh, popping and i think people are saying in the in the comments that you're i think maybe your audio is cutting out a little bit maybe your um your internet connection or something like that i mean you are oh, so, yeah just letting you know is there something i can do on this um maybe because if you go I to the cam and mic effect. if you go to camera and if you turn you click on um camera and you go to show advanced if you can maybe look if you lower the camera resolution down maybe that'll help i think it's a bandwidth issue here but anyway no, i think it's very interesting some of the stuff that you were saying earlier about how uh vertically you can't extrapolate from the, the different channels you know because stereotypically you have your left and right and you can kind of extrapolate the center of the phantom image um of course there's issues with that that we know of that it's not exactly the same as having a, a center channel but very interesting that it works so so differently so much more different when you have it vertically oh I, something is not going right here i have a problem oh, it says that it's hearing you're hearing feedback i can hear joe talking through his end Maybe, maybe do you have my your speakers up? I don't know if you have headphones or something that might help too. I don't hear any echoing anymore. No. Did he okay. mute himself? I don't know. All right. Uh, well, anyway, I just want to make sure that we can hear you properly because it was kind of hard um, with that going on. Wow. Okay, that's a shame. Um, hey, this sounds good. better. That's good. It was it Whatever all, you did. It was, all, was it all the time like that? Oh, no, no, no. Just no a, in the just last couple the minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Just the last before I told you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, You're good. But yeah, what okay. what you were saying it was uh, uh, about um, not being able to hear the sounds in the vertical plane, right? If that was you so interesting, yeah. If you have two speakers, one on top, let's say your front, your front left, and your you know front height left or whatever, and you try to pinpoint something in between, you won't hear that, right? That's what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So and you, even, until you turn your head to the side, then you could hear it because it's now on a horizontal plane with our ears. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll be yeah. honest. I mean, you're 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 um, going into a lot of detail. I want to make sure everyone can keep up. Um, I know for me, I'm like, oh man, this is so much good information. I want to. I feel like taking notes right now. I know, Chana, <laughs> that's how you felt when you talked to him. I have a full page of notes I was taking <laughs> during during our last couple of chats. Yeah. Um, and then like, it's like an hour and a half. I'm like, okay, okay. okay we got to stop. We got to, well, let's, let's get some topics and try to rein a few things in. Um, I'm still stuck on the part where you're saying like, you know, the, the, a single source of sound and how that source might have a, a direct sound and I guess reflected sound. And you're trying to make sure you capture the reflections, the reflections properly. Yeah. In that 3d space. Right. But Joe, and, that's a very important topic you are bringing up, and which is not understood because pe people typically think about where a source is located, and that has to do with our survival instinct. We yeah. want to understand. We want to understand the, let's say, where we live in. Our the, the our hearing system is like a radar going on all the time, day and night. Yeah, we want to hear you are safe. Yeah, and the point is when you can recreate, and you can trick your brain that you are like in that kind of environment that creates like a relaxed sphere atmosphere the moment your brain is missing one of these dimensions then it feels it is not a natural sound environment mm. so with surround sound i think that's one of the most important things with surround sound your brain immediately knows yeah oh there is there are like <laughs> there's like an axis missing you it, it feels immediately that and that was the the biggest shock that I had the moment when you add, let's say, this 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 uh, this plane in a way that it tricks our brain to believe, yeah, mm. that you were in that space. It creates not only an 
and, and form of relaxation for your brain. Your brain has less effort to do to analyze the sound field, yeah, mm. uh, which is very important. What's, a, what's in the, a comment I hear from very often when people for the first time hear our 3D, they say, oh, wow, man, this sounds so much more relaxing than I'm used to hear from our performance, yeah. That has to do with the fact that we create that more natural feel. And it has to do with the speaker layout as well. If you put your speakers a little bit too much overhead and you create that non-coherence, yeah, then our brain picks it up again and you lose that kind of natural feel. Mm. Yeah. Would you say it'd be like, let's say if you're in a cave and you're used to this echo, a certain amount of reverb that you go, and then a sound comes out and then it has like different no reverb. reverb. Would you be like, yeah. what the heck? What is that? And why is it sounding like that? when the whole time you're expecting objects to have similar reverb in that room. Is something yeah, like that? One, yeah, that's a good question because I was not even answering your, your previous question about the 3D reflections, yeah? Mm. Most of the sound sounds in nature, they have, let's say, uh, what we pick up is are the 3D reflections, yeah? Let's say only if you're like very close to that source, yeah, but very close, yeah? then you hear, um, let's say, more direct sound than the reflected sound. I remember when I was, uh, made my first production that I ever did in my first studio I had ever had, yeah, um, there was like an acoustical problem in that studio. And I was not realizing it was having such an impact because I was sitting on like one and a half meters or two meters, like seven foot or something for my speakers. Yeah, And I thought, yeah, but I really hear these speakers. The rest is like, Perhaps a little influence, but mm. that's so wrong. That's completely wrong. Yeah, ninety percent from what you hear in that room, even you that that close is, let's say, is, is your room. Yeah, and that's, with source is the same thing. The source uh, sounds really sound completely different in acoustical different environment. Yeah, and what you have to bring up is, of course, you have to capture those three that three three D reflections. Yeah. Probably when you ever heard the demos from Auto 3D, the demo disc, for instance, that tractor is very nice. Oh, that's the best. That's like one of the best ones. Like you it's... cannot reproduce something like that with, with object based technology because then you have a mono sound and you just have that mono sound passing by. And in fact, what creates that emotion are the 3D reflections. You All see? Right, so... And, I, and I, I, yeah, I don't want to throw you off too much, but, uh, you know, I'm a fan of uh, binaural because I've found that like binaural to me, I get a lot of externalization and it's just, you know, two mics. Uh, and, you know, I've heard stuff where it sounds like I can pinpoint how far something is. And, you know, the head transfer function and all that is kind of just worked out because it's right there. You know, it doesn't have to figure out where the reflection should be. It just captures it as your ears would kind of capture it. Um, anyway, uh, the thing that's interesting about that is even though I'm wearing, let's say, headphones or in-ear monitors, I can hear something externalized maybe 13 feet away. Mm -hmm. uh, is that And that's something that I really haven't experienced too much with any surround formats. Um, I haven't, I, you know, to be honest, I haven't tried too much Oro 3D stuff, so I can't speak on that. But what I can say is nothing really goes outside of my room. The boundary is the wall. So uh, if something's supposed to sound further, I mean, it just goes up to the room, you know, the walls or how high my ceiling is, you know, something to that effect. Now we're coming to a very interesting point, uh, Joe, and that's the following, yeah? Um, I think you absolutely should try out Auto 2D because exactly what you described is what the format can do. You can hear sound beyond the speakers. And very important is then the nature of how it is being recorded. Because, let's say, these 3D reflections are important for our brain to reproduce, let's say, where you are and that space. So if you can reproduce the most important ones, which is what we try to do with our format, I think our format is selected as, let's say, very efficient, yeah? Um, you're coming very close to, let's say, the natural reproduction of those sounds. And most of the sound reproductions for our brain, very important, are located between ear level and about 30 degrees. And that's exactly where our speaker layouts are, all around listeners. And then you can create that depth. And that's what you cannot create if you would, if I, if I with Auto Max, for instance, we, I did a lot of uh, tests with, with object-based technology like more than 15 years ago. And I was always surprised coming to that point, what you exactly described. Yeah. Now, I can tell you that if you have the right speaker layout, 
that you can reproduce a much precise, better localization of that object when you have those 3D reflections inside. So you use like just only 10 channels compared to, an, an, uh, let's say, a source with some metadata and you're going to move it around because mm. you miss a cause, let's say, the relationship and all the changes of the corners with these 3D reflections, how, how it comes to you. Mm. And so even if you have that, I, let me put it like that, wave field synthesis is very interesting. You know, wave field synthesis is the idea, but I'm going to describe it very easy that you understand it. Instead of using two microphones and two speakers, you make a front of microphones, like in, 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 in 10 feet, you have like 15 microphones, and you put in again 15 speakers to reproduce every speaker. Now you can you reproduce a wave front like that. Yeah. Now the interesting point is that with reproducing that, you have much more like that kind of three-dimensional feel. You really feel the depth as well before and behind the speakers. With wave field synthesis, when you use that amount of a lot of speakers in front of you, you can position even sounds up front of the speaker. Mm. Yeah. But then if you do that, you have, let's say, because of all the speakers, there's like, of course, an, an comp filtering between those distances because, you know, every distance is related to a kind of frequency and all these harmonics. Yeah. So that means the, the sound color is not so natural. So you gain, let's say, position, you gain, let's say, the place where certain source sounds are located, but it has a less, let's say, it is not as good, let's say, for the timbre, for the sound color. Mm. And now in music, especially in music, the timbre is very important. Yeah? Sure. People, uh, yeah. they, they, let's say, they rehearse a whole life to have a good sound. Yeah. So, and the, the, what you try not to kill if you record them is, let's say, that sound quality. Yeah. So, with, with this, let's say, in all this kind of technology, there are like pros and cons. Sometimes what you gain on, let's say, having more the ability to position certain things and the depth, then you mm. lose a little more in the timbre. Mm. Be aware that we cannot reproduce natural sounds. Even with a million speakers around us, we will not be able to reproduce natural sound. That's how sensitive our ear system is. That's another topic I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> but say the amount of information that we go every second through our life. It's really amazing, yeah. Right. Uh, here's here's a question from Mac, uh, Matt Buckmaster. Doesn't the object-based decoder, Oro, Atmos, et cetera, create the appropriate reflections for the various objects based on the locations specified in the metadata? That's a very good question, yeah. It is not. Mm. Mm. So we are, let's say, what we do is we just only do, let's say, this object, yeah, and it does not recreate it. What we can do is let's say with automatic, but the concept of automatic was comp something completely different. Yeah, um, what you can do is, of course, you can add in such a renderer. Yeah, you can add a kind of a system that is creating the three D reflections. Yeah, but that's a system. Let's say that is something perhaps we might see in the future. Yeah, but it is not there yet in the existing uh, system that it creates on top of that those reflections. And so I the, the the reflections need to be captured. Exactly. Right, yeah. now, right now, they can't be created by the metadata or whatever. Exactly. The point is, um, see yourself, yeah, how different every room is where you are in. Every room, you recognize immediately, let's say, the kind of sound, yeah. How can you just recreate a system which is immediately picking up which object, how it is going to reproduce with the kind of similar uh, 3D uh, reflections, yeah. So in, we are far away from that, I think. In my mind, as you know, like I was saying, I was so into this binaural recording thing that I was really like trying to figure out like, I wonder if there's a way to extrapolate out from binaural and go outward to multiple channels. And you know, I, that's that's the question. Like, and I led me down this rabbit hole and trying to figure out who's thought of stuff like that. I saw uh, this guy, uh, VA Polky. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess he did a lot of stuff and DTS picked up uh, some of his work. Um, because it was like open source, something like that. But um, but yeah, it, that to me, that's is that ever possible? I know this is a little bit off track, but can you no, take a binaural not. recording and uh, extrapolate it out to multiple channels and have it sa sound accurate? So now we're having kind of a shared experience instead of just me with yeah. headphones. Yeah. Now the point is, let's say there's a different technology which is called ambisonics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ambisonics has the ability, let's say, to pick up sound. Yeah 
with just like a very small microphone system. Yeah, the, with the and then yeah, could, yeah, it's very it is very easy to record. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then it's trying to extrapolate all these kind of things. And the more speaks for let's say the more channels you can uh, record it on, the better you can reproduce. That's the call they called it in order. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. Or the second order, the third order, mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. But the third order is already like I think 16 channels, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then what I found with Ambisonics is it's mathematically a fantastic system, it's genius. It's uh, Michael Gerson is behind this, yeah. Uh, it's already from the 70s, it's already years ago when it was invented, yeah. But mm -hmm. it never came to the market, and it has to do with a few things, yeah. First of all, it does not reproduce that kind of natural there is so so let's say there is especially in the lower forms like till the third order you still feel a lot of face issues going on yeah, yeah? i mean I've, I've experimented with those because i was checking out like some vr stuff and i wanted to see like you know what sounded realistic and it, it, to me that didn't sound as realistic some of the stuff where you could move around and like turn your head to me that didn't sound as realistic as just straight up binaural but so that's why i ask about binaural specifically um if there's a way to extrapolate out. But anyway, I don't want to derail what you're talking about here. I just feel like it's it somewhat related, somewhat yeah. related. Some people might think that, let's say, using a headphone that you can cl come closer to this natural environment. I think what you, I believe what is right, Joe, is if you have that typically like that uh, headphone, stereo headphone thing, yeah, then you're get very, coming very close to, let's say, a natural 3D field. But now what we do is the opposite around, yeah? What we do is we create all the speakers, yeah, a lot of speakers you create that sound and you're going to binauralize that and put it, let's say, with and these are again how to call it artificial tricks that we use to, mm -hmm. to bring it, let's say, in your headphones. And what you do is you add, in fact, HRTFs, you add reflections to, to create your brain that effect. It's again mm. an artificial effect. Yeah. I just saw an interesting question before, yeah, which was about that uh, that tractor, yeah. He said, okay, the tractor doesn't sound as an object, but I tell you what, if you see the microphone standing up and you see that tractor passing by, that was a massive beast versus the little. <laughs> so it was, you have all these reflections, yeah? And that is, yeah. that's another thing, yeah? And that's always the point. You have that emotional experience, yeah? But of course, let's say, if you compare it to the really nature things, you have much more, you have much more information and how big has a system to be that you can create exactly the same thing as in nature. I think that's very hard. I think there is at this moment, not any kind of convenient system for me that is recreating the same thing as nature. Yeah? And so that's, let's say, I think the, the, the message that I have is what, I, as I told you, even with a million speakers around our head, we will not be able to reproduce that. And then the question is, yeah, how to record a million channels or a million information and reproduce that. Yeah. Um, and even with ambisonics, it's not possible to do it either. Yeah. So it is, it is, let's say, there is not a system that, that can reproduce it. And, and the question is as well, how to do it. Yeah. Uh, efficiency. I think the art, of this is trying to uh, capture it and reproduce it in the most efficient way. And that's what Auto 3D is all about. Okay. Uh, we, hey, can, can you show us a picture of the microphones, please? I thought that was really cool. And and while you're doing that, um, Michael asks, uh, at most streams from Apple TV, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Disney Plus, since Oro 3D can be embedded in uncompressed 5.1 PCM, why not offer streaming services? Oh, that's a good question. Let's go <laughs> to the streaming question. But but you want me first to discuss the let's uh, let's go on the streaming things. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. yeah. There. Let's go to the streaming things. I think that might be very interesting as well. Uh, let me jump very fast now to. Um, uh, I feel like yeah. Wilfred, you're gonna have to go from like technical to business to legal. <laughs> Yeah, you know, to lead, to legal. <laughs> a lot of hats you got to wear. All today. kinds of stuff you're gonna have to talk about, huh? Yeah, but I'm. Let's say my background allows to talk about lots of stuff as well. That's all right. <laughs> I have a very interesting. Uh, yeah, very interesting things behind me. Let me say, uh, and and that knowledge I could build up was really fantastic. Yeah. So a uh, moment. Let me go uh, again to that sharing thing. Yeah, I share. And then screen, uh, share screen. I find then... this stuff so fascinating. This software is very, very interesting, by the way. It works very well, yeah. 
mask Azir, I think I think you see now this right yeah the live performance one you might have to switch uh if you want to show full screen because uh choose okay. the window again once you're full screen you see that full screen no it's a, it's a blank uh, it's screen a, it's a know? blank screen a blank screen yeah, yeah. just oh the, here the, now we see the the presentation a moment, a moment. i probably i was um let me try it a moment again. Sorry for this. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. I'm going again to the. We're going to make this a, a three hour thing anyway. You're going to stay up till like 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be morning <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, if we, get all, we have so many questions. Uh, so yeah. basically, I need to check out Oro 3D. You know, the other thing that was was interesting, Chana, is you're saying that, that uh, if we were to set up our speakers in that manner, you know, other formats might sound better too. Yeah. I thought that was kind of, I was setting up, yeah. I just set up my speakers the other day. I'm like, oh man, maybe I should wait till this uh, presentation before I start putting these speakers up. So I, I remember there's this one, there's this one other slide um, you showed last time to me, Wilfried, and it was a, a, of a theater. And in the theater, in the center, they have all the side speakers in Atmos pointing at the center, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But with Oro, um, like like they're they're diagonally oh, pointing to the person, right? Um, and with Oro, the speaker's on the wall, but just firing into the middle of the room, not specifically aimed at the person. And so um I was just thinking about that the other day while I was walking my dog, because my dog was like six feet in front of me. What is this? Is this yeah, they, yeah, we had a picture the other day. Is this, oh, okay. is this you see something here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think if I swap now, do you see now the whole thing on the one screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So this is about streaming. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. three. Uh, let's say we are working on the streaming technology already for many years. Yeah. And we are coming on the market very soon with something which is, let's say, will will be pretty shocking. Yeah. Because the experience that you get from our three D, we can bring this live. Yeah. Now, there was a very interesting event, which was the first ever, uh, let's say, um, event on uh, on this kind of level, yeah, which was in Tokyo, by the way. Yeah, this was the first time that discrete 3D audio, yeah, over live with a live performance was streamed over IP, so over standard internet. Yeah, this test was done together with Wawao and NTT in October in Japan. Yeah. So the idea was, you see on the left side, that was an, uh, just two uh, instruments, like an, a live uh, pianist and uh, percussion. These are very sensitive in instruments, by the way, for any kind of codec. Yeah, There's a lot of trans transient information in this, and there's always like very tricky in, in transient codecs. Yeah? So they used very critical instruments, and that was stream just over standard internet to Belgium, which is a far distance, yeah? To give you an idea, the latency to get there was only like one minute already <laughs> from the live for a live performance, yeah? Now, um, there were like 300 guests into that hall, yeah? And um, yeah, so they were there and they were listening there at the same time. And in the foyer, there was a setup where they could hear the streamed result, yeah? But the idea was that they were doing this not only in the foyer, but as well to about 100 households in Japan. So 100 households in Japan having installed our 3D system, yeah, were hearing it as well, yeah, to check. It was like just a check to see everything is fluently from a technical point of view. And at the same time, it was distributed as well to our uh, soundbar. Our technologies has developed a new soundbar and all people that I hear, let's see, even even our competitors, they all say this is the best samba ever. Uh, due to COVID, it was not able to get it last year on the market, but probably it comes, let's say, by the end of this year, beginning next year, I think, on the market, which is really stunning. It's not so it's not so expensive, but you really have almost the same feeling like you hear like ten or twelve speakers around your head. It's it's the best virtualization technology that I think is existing on the planet. Yeah. So this was a test in many ways, yeah. Now, what happened is at um, at the playback, yeah, so at, in this concert hall, 
at the foyer, there was an Auto 9.1 setup where the journalists and let's say the, the people the, in the room, they could walk and check the live sound compared to the reproduced sound. Yeah? And the most stunning part was the fact that people were so shocked how good it was translating the sound from the hall into, let's say, in that reproduction environment. But even more, most of the visitors, they said, I prefer the stream sound the because the microphones where they're positioned, they, give, they pick up so much more detail, which I cannot hear where, where I'm sitting in the hall. The microphones, they have that kind of sweet spot experience. They're only like a few seats in the hall where you can have that same experience. Yeah. Now, the, um, what you were hearing was exactly an, uh, an, an PCM quality. It's exactly the same quality that you can hear from a Blu-ray disc. Yeah? But you can hear it then with 2K picture. So uh, Huawei Japan is in the second past of this year. So by the end of the year, they will run out program already with this in Japan. Yeah. So this was the concept, one concert. Uh, over IP to a cinema theater, to a home, and to soundbars, and compare the experience with the live experience. Yeah. And how many how many microphones were used there? Uh, oh, it was only nine microphones. Okay. So nine microphones to mimic a uh, Oro nine point one. Exactly. Yeah. So and uh, Raj Raj Azakura, he was there. It's one of the famous journalists in the world, and uh, he he wrote that quote even on Yahoo.com. Yeah. And he said this experience was for me so groundbreaking. He compared it with the, the with the Grammel, uh, with the gramophone from Edison. He said this is, was so groundbreaking. This is like what it can do. It can bring a a, a, a concert hall to a home, and you have the really the feeling you are there. Yeah. So for him, it was an, a groundbreaking experience. And this is like the the first one. Yeah. So we have let's say we are coming with some special technology that can bring streaming to a completely different level than what you used to hear now for let's say and this was only with a bandwidth for audio for three megabit per second and which normally all people can have yeah and we are coming with let's say a similar experience with about 10 times less with about 384 kilobit per second you have a fully transparent audio quality so we last uh, i think it was last time we were talking about this image here yeah i don't know if this is is accurate but we're kind of making fun we're like oh there's no sweets Where, where's the center chair you know i don't know if you tuned into that but you know some of the things that the criticisms were like okay well if this is optimal um you know the speaker looks like it's kind of close to the, the ceiling and so we're gonna get some weird stuff happening with the you know the reflection off the ceiling with it pointed forward versus let's say down you're kind of uh increasing the angle from let's say the tweeter uh compared to you know, if it is facing down. So. Yeah, the point is the point is like you know, you are uh, hitting a few topics here, uh, Jenna. Yeah. So the point is, let's say, how to let's say to bring the speakers up. Yeah. If you have mm -hmm. them closer to the ceiling, you might have let's say all these kind of things with reflections and things coming from the ceiling. But even if you put them from the top down, yeah, you have other problems as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I was looking into my research is the fact that you need three different layers to reproduce natural sound. Yeah? You cannot reproduce it with two layers only. Yeah? And if you have two layers only, you better, uh, let's say, use them, let's say, in the place where most of the 3D reflections and their source sounds yeah, are coming from. And these are, let's say, between 0 and 30 degrees. The moment when you're going much higher, you lose, in fact, the vertical coherence. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, an, an, an interesting thing is, of course, there's always place above the corner speakers of a 5.1 setup, yeah? Now, in this, I don't know, yeah, this picture comes from a plugin, in fact, because this is not, in fact, the description of how it being installed. Normally, this, this left and right speaker mm -hmm. you have there should be a little bit more, let's say, closer to that, closer to that screen, yeah? So you have, let's say, mm -hmm. more like in, uh, fact, this is like a circle-based 5.1 setup, but that's one uh, one remark I have here. And mm -hmm. additionally, let, let's say the height speakers, yeah, they have to be a little bit tilted. What I see often as well that people tilt the height speakers to exactly to your ears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what I found is that the moment when you tilt your height speakers, that they're crossing a little bit above your uh, your head, mm -hmm. like two feet or something above your head. Yeah, you have more than spatial reflections, which is coming closer to that natural way of hearing. Yeah. 
There's see. not. There's. It sounds for a lot of technical guys is ah, but Luffy ten, you are not on access, so that has, you have a color, of course, of your uh, let's say not being on access as as a different color. But that color is not really so much big difference. A bigger difference is the moment when you angle into big, it gives not that kind of same spatial environment, spatial mm. feel. So that's something which I think it's uh, it's very interesting to understand about. Yeah. Um, another thing, what you are asking me as well, if let's say, if you have the speakers, yeah, that's one of the things interesting to to talk to as well. Is let's say with object based sounds in a very big hall, yeah, mm -hmm. you have a completely different kind of concept that you have to follow compared to what you have, uh, let's say, in a small room, yeah. In a large room, yeah, if you want to have objects going all around, all the speakers has to be, uh, let's say, converted to one uh, place. Let me check if I can very fast yeah. bring up uh, some slides, yeah, uh, related to that, yeah. Um, it's all very so interesting. I feel like, man, one hour is not enough to mm -hmm. cover all of the I, stuff. I, that... I'm happy to do it over more hours if you like to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh let me let me go here forward. i feel bad because i know it's late over there oh don't worry about it i'm so passionate about this it doesn't matter all right he's awake now <laughs> yeah all right yeah but, well when we were talking last week he's like oh i'm usually up to like 1 or 2 a.m so <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> so what chana okay. usually calls me yeah yeah, so yeah you, we totally... do you see my do you see my screen again? yeah yeah see this is this is the slide i was talking about yeah okay so let me go. I'm going to make it now full screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Do you see it like full screen now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is, let's say, a 5.1. This is coming from that, from, let's say, from Atmos, for instance. Yeah. So this is the way uh, they position their speakers. You see all the speakers on the sides. Yeah. They are angled to an, to an, an area here in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is. If you have sounds of objects coming from the screens and you have to, to move them around, yeah, when you're sitting here, if this speaker is, let's say, not uh, directed to that middle of the room, it sounds very uh, it sounds very dull, of course, because you are missing, let's say, you are not hearing it in the, in the right, uh, let's say, volume as well. Yeah? And so you have to direct those speakers all to, let's say, one space. Now, what you should know is, let's say, all the speakers here, yeah, perhaps not the first one because this is, let's say, these are the side screen channels, but starting from where the seats are from here, this is just one channel. So you see my mouse? Mm -hmm. yeah? So this is one channel. Now, you have to know that even in object-based movies, yeah, more than uh, 90 to 95% of the sound energy yeah, comes from the channel-based sounds, not from the objects. Yeah? But that means, let's say, all these sounds, every speaker is recreating the same, exactly same, exactly sound. Because the idea of such an array from history comes from the fact that wherever you are seating, yeah, or seated, you hear almost like the same surround experience to come as close as possible to the way it was being mixed, yeah, that, that you mm -hmm. have the same experience as intended by the creators. Yeah? Now, if you have, let's say, an object-based, let's say, in the hybrid solution like in Atmos, yeah, or like same thing with Automax as well, but with Automax, we use a completely different kind of speaker layout, yeah. Um, you have, let's say, if you convert all the sounds to one specific spot, then you create an, a kind of an acoustical clustering and a lot of phase issues. And that's what you hear with the systems. It does not reproduce the channel-based sound as an open sound as it was that we are used to have from channel-based sound. Yeah. Now you compromise channel-based sound, yeah, to get, of course, these objects a little bit better. But they're not that many objects used in in the film. Fair. They're like in, the a, amount is perhaps huge, yeah, but it is nothing compared to the amount of uh, objects which are, let's say, sitting in the channel-based uh, uh, sounds. Yeah. And if you compare it, for instance, now with Auro, yeah. We are we are building further on the existing 5.1 system. So that means if you play back 5.1 uh, over Auto 3D, yeah, then you get exactly the same 5.1 as intended by the creators. Yeah, if you if Dolby Atmos is rendering their mix over 5.1, it is not let's say the same installation because the speakers are much higher located 
and they're directed completely different, which is giving a different sound experience as well. Yeah. So um, let's let's see. Our result is with Auto 3D. We have a much larger sweet spot. Yeah. Um, compared to what you have, let's say, with with our competitors' format. Yeah. And the larger sweet spot is not unimportant in a cinema theater. As an exhibitor, you want to give as much as possible people the same uh, experience. experience. Yeah. And it is then it is let's say then it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, we only need to have let's say the things out of this quadrant has to be adjusted a little bit to the middle, because let's say and here as well we have uh, we add additional screen channels and those uh, proscenium screen channels there are directed as well, but they are not being used for the channel based sound. There's like only for let's say the objects. Or let's say for that part, yeah. Another difference is, for instance, the the, the ceiling channels. You see, uh, with Atmos they have that ceiling channel. They are directed as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, what well, this is the yellow ones, yeah, which is typically the 5.1 as it's meant to be, yeah. Uh, from let's say following the THX standard or following the recommendations from the cinema industry already since many decades, yeah. So we use the same install and we add two layers on top of that. Yeah, we use much mm -hmm. less speakers. Yeah, in total, it might be about the same amount compared to uh, Dolby Atmos, but in fact, we use it on the same concept. We double the 5.1, so you have that kind of vertical stereo field all around the listener. Yeah, and then of course there's a third layer. Yeah, on top of that. Yeah, here you see as well the side effect. Yeah, you see. Typically, THX of, let's say, the recommendation says that between 15 degrees is average. Yeah? So that means about here, you normally put your surround, the surround channels and then you, you direct them a little bit to two-thirds of the room to have as much as possible a natural spread in the room. But you see, this is the Atmos speaker, which is much higher. In fact, the Atmos speaker is about located between Auro's height layer, which is unique, and this one. And let's say that that's one of the issues you have. If you have like here's the screen channels, most of the sounds coming from the screen channels are ear level sounds like passing bikes and cars and things like that. But if the speaker is located that high, you cannot reproduce sounds below that speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's say with R3D, you can localize much better, let's say, the sounds coming from the screen. If they're coming from the top of the screen, you can position them here or you can position them overhead. Yeah? You can position them there as well. Yeah. Let me check if I have, um, uh, if I have let's say, another picture uh, which is uh, giving better view on that speaker layout. But I think then I might have to go to another uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, ah, here I have it. Okay, good. It's in the same year. This is the kind. Do you see still my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is the kind of the vertical spread of sound. Yeah. So most important, of course, are ear level sounds. Yeah. If you can reproduce them from ear level, I think that's a good system at home. At least at home, we have that ear level experience. Yeah. And that's very important. Most of the sounds are located around ear level. And of course, let's say on the second layer, the height layer. Yeah. And then there is a third layer, which is a top layer, which is in fact more for flyover effects. Yeah. Even in small rooms, you do not need it because you can recreate that flyover effect from a phantom image that you create from your second layer. Yeah. Of course, you don't have the, the source point idea then, but it gives really that flyover experience. Yeah. And the way it is being used, in fact, is here. There's the way it is being used by Auromax. We have about 500 installs worldwide in Auromax now, yeah, in cinema theaters. Cinemark, by the way, Cinemark in 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 uh, in US, they have I think more than 200, 250 screens with Auromax. Yeah, uh, their XD screens are using Auromax. Yeah, with and uh, let's say and they use the render from Barco because. That's why that was I just uh, what I heard of. I picked up when people say when you reproduce a system over Auto Max, even if it is mixed in a different format, yeah, it sounds more natural. But that has to do with this speaker layout, of course. It translates absolutely the place it should be, but you have let's say more capabilities to spread the sound in the vertical axis, yeah. And you have here the height, let's say the the normal base layer, the height layer, and the top layer yeah and i think that is very important that it is that vertical resolution which is key
to immersive sound. On top of that, we have the same thing on the screen. And I think a lot of engineers, especially in Hollywood, they like the Auto 3D format because you can create so much more depth and a coherence with all the objects on screen. Yeah. So this is unique. There is no other immersive sound system on the market, yeah, where you have in the screen channels, yeah, as well the capability to have that vertical uh, axis on the screen. Yeah. So it, you're talking about that center height channel? No, I'm talking about the whole thing. Yeah? I'm talking thing. about, let's say here we have, let's say for instance with with um, with Dolby Atmos, yeah, you have here like uh, five, three to five channels depending on the size of the screen, yeah. But you don't have a height layer. Typically, they put the speakers even up more high. Oh, I see. I see. You know, they have only one layer. Yeah, we have let's get that vertical stereo field on the screen channels, which is creating the capability of more depth, more natural sound, and it sounds much more transparent. You cannot believe how much more transparent the sound becomes if you have if you can divide those those sounds over the different screen channels. And there are a lot of sounds that you can put in your height layer, yeah, which are not let's say which not have to be located there. Even music, yeah. If you're sitting in a hole, you do not feel like the sound is coming from too high. But the moment when you put them in your top layer, that's something else. In your overhead layer, that sounds very unnatural to have there too much music, yeah. But let's say in your height layer, you can have so much more detail of your music. Yeah? You have to understand that nowadays with digital, you have easy between 500 and 1,000 tracks that you are mixing to, let's say, most of the sounds are mixing coming from the left, center, right. Yeah? So hundreds of sounds are coming together in these three channels. Yeah? And there's a lot of masking. There's a lot of things that you do not pick up because they're like physically masked. Yeah. And the moment when you can just spread them in different layers, it's amazing how much more transparency mm, you have right. and how much more beautiful the sound is. So that's an additional advantage. And you, you have more place for the dialogue as well, which is very important. Yeah. So I think there's an important topic is that vertical stereo field, which is typically about 30 degrees is ideal. Yeah. Uh, this brings me to this, this research I did. Yeah. You see here, this is, let's say, ideal, you're like about 30 degrees. It works already from 20 degrees pretty well, yeah? 25 degrees, 30 degrees is ideal. And especially when you're sitting in a theater, you do not need it to 30 degrees. When you have, let's say, this angle in, in even from 15 degrees in the theater, it sounds already fantastic. But for home theaters, I would rather say, if you have the chance to put it like 20, 30 degrees, that's ideal, yeah? The moment when you're going higher, let's say from 40 to 45 degrees, then you start to lose this coherence. And then, then of course, let's say that's where our competitors form do their overhead speakers. But then you have, let's say, that kind of completely disconnection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want that, uh, you, yeah, with adding the third layer on top of that, of course, you can create this kind of uh, non coherent sound field if you like it. Yeah. But then you need, of course, to install three layers. Yeah um that's the reason why i came to different speaker layouts yeah where you can preserve the artistic intent because the idea is if it is like a movie created with that setup speaker layout in a movie theater you bring it home you have the same experience yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's one of the main advantages from our com for our format to let's say compare to our competitors format because they make it flexible, but let's say that's much more harder to, let's say, to guarantee the same, uh, the same um, result as, uh, let's say, as uh, created by the, uh, by the creators. Yeah. Now, you have two layers and three layer systems. Yeah. In small rooms, you, there's not absolutely so much the need to, uh, to use the three layers. Yeah. Of course, if you have that third layer, you can have, let's say, more detailed information sometimes yeah but we have in fact two systems two and three layer which is our 9.1 and our 11.1 the only difference is like here it is a 7.1 basis and with four height channels and here it is only a 5.1 plus four now this one the auto 9.1 is um, that's what i brought already on the market in 2006 at the aes at the aes conferences yeah and a lot of people were very inspired about that because it gives in the most efficient way that three-dimensional space with the capability on a 5.1 playback as well. So it is 5.1 compatible, and that's, let's say, it creates that very easy 
three-dimensional sound field in a very natural way. Of course, if you go to larger rooms and you can add more speakers yeah, to spread the sound, yeah, then you're coming up to auto 13.1. And auto 13.1 is a 7.1 bass, five up. Yeah. I was thinking about long time, it exists in, in our in, in, in our in my book that I made in 2005, yeah, up till out of 15.1, which is then two 7.1 layers above each other, yeah, and a voice of God. But what I found is at the end, uh, the more channels you add, the more issues you had as well, incompatibility and distribution and things like that. Mm. On a Blu-ray disc, we could easily do out of 15.1 as well, which is, but typically you're like, there's not being used. Yeah, out of 13.1 covers all the needs you need, let's say from a channel-based environment. Yeah, all right. The moment you add more channels, you add issues about, let's say, compatibility, because the idea is that if you create something in out of 13.1, and you play back in Auto 9.1, you have almost the same experience. And it is very close to each other. These speaker layouts are very, let's say, very compatible. Yeah, And our technology allows as well to bring easy all the speaker layouts in that kind of same 5.1 uh, layer. Let's say that's the way our encoder works, Yeah, which is based on the same principle as a lossless uh, encoder. Yeah. It's let's say is a mathematical thing. So our codec does not have psych acoustic uh, optimization as our competitors do have, which is of course creating hearable artifacts, which is in fact not the case with our uh, let's say with our codec. So we are much closer to that warm let's say natural sound that you hear from un that you know from uncompressed audio. Yeah. Wilfred, so this yeah. is a, a good uh, question. Is is it possible for you to share this uh, presentation as a PDF? Maybe we can link to it later on for the, you know, because I know you have a lot of slides, maybe a, maybe a version of this PDF or a version of this slideshow, just because I think people really want to get into it and, you know, oh, yeah. read it at their own pace, if, if possible. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but, you know, that's what I do. Yeah, you see, I think the total amount of slides here is like like in the two hundreds, <laughs> and another, another <laughs> and it's just, another. It's just only one of them. Yeah, but yeah, then, yeah. No, it, I, you, mean, I I will share it. I will make this this kind of share this because I think it's very interesting to have. Yeah, uh, yes. here like these. I'll hear the microphones. Yeah, people China, are interested in it. Yeah. The other thing is also I don't we don't have anybody scheduled for next time. So if you're available, maybe. Uh, next week, maybe we can continue. I don't know. We'll 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 talk about it afterwards. I I am happy to do it every week for as so long as you want. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, honestly, uh, we'll ask questions and keep going into more detail. You you think we're joking, but uh, you know, we're all very interested. And so yeah. to try to do this in an hour and talk about the stuff that you've spent years, you know, doing, it's it's not really possible. We're gonna miss yeah. out on too much stuff. And you can't explain all the stuff you need to explain. You know, I, I think the elephant in the room is, you know, there's, I think, Chana, you've said it. You wish there was more content. Here in the States, yes. Here in the yeah. States. I think somebody said Euro 3D <laughs> earlier yeah. before this. And here's Reginald. Uh, why isn't Hollywood adapt, uh, ad adapting the standard? I would imagine adopting the standard. Yeah. This as the standard. Yeah, but uh, Hollywood has, in, in cinema, we have a lot of movies out, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that I think that, that, that our competitors have a little bit more than double of the amount of DCPs out in the market than us. Yeah, So we have a lot of movies out where, mm -hmm. but the point is you cannot find them fair in the States. You cannot find them easy in the home. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the fact that the studios have to decide if they're going to print it on the Blu-ray disc, yes or no. Yeah. And mm. that has that has often to do with the chicken and egg stuff, you know. If mm. you're like or a few million installs at home, you can easy say, okay, okay, there will be enough uh, people who want to buy that, yeah. But I do not know, let's say we have many, many thousands of installs in, in America, yeah. Uh, but perhaps not enough to release as well the Blu-ray disc, yeah. Um, to, for instance, at this moment, we have worldwide about 1 million, for more than 1 million home theaters installed mm. with our 3D, yeah. And uh, which is already, fair. now we, more and more content is coming. But we have, let's say, I think we are mostly leading in music, more music than than movies. Yeah, movie industry is coming up, and the more installs we will have, more easy the movies will come as well. So it takes longer than I envisioned ourselves. Yeah. Now I ask a few uh, studios, okay, if if there is a way that we can help them there, yeah, 
But if you see the amount of costs involved just to release one movie title is huge. Yeah. So yeah. I, my company is not not not. Uh, let's say I've not so deep pockets like our competitors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I and, lived I lived uh, near Burbank for a long time, so there was a Dolby at or Dolby Studios right there, and I'm, I mean they've been around for a long time, and so. Uh, I kind of joked around before the saying like, man, these guys are like more of a marketing and legal more so than uh, yeah. coming out yeah, with new, new I tech. Mean, I mean, they're great at, great at, uh, you know, getting their stuff out there, I think. Yeah. But the point is, yeah, but uh, let me put it like this. Yeah. When we came to the market immediately with a lot of success, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then Dolby immediately, let's say, came very fast as well with Atmos to be sure they have, let's say, an answer on, 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 on their side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, and which is fair as let's say competition is very good. Yeah. So, sure. but the point is, let's say, and, and the, the Hollywood studios immediately, immediately embraced the other 3D format, all of them. Yeah. Um, so let's say Skywalker was the first. Yeah. The Skywalker mm -hmm. immediately, uh, decided to install in their Studio A, which is uh, the most known, um, uh, let's say, mixing stage in LA, in, uh, for the most popular one, yeah, I think in, in, in the States and perhaps even worldwide. I think about 40% of, of all the top 100 movies are mixed at Skywalker Sound, yeah, so they are a really top reference, and they as first embraced it, yeah, and then in Hollywood it was dub stage, yeah, uh, which is close by the headquarters from Dolby, by instance, yeah, uh, in that stage at Burbank, they installed the first system then in, in Hollywood. And when a lot of directors heard, they said, okay, hey, let's go for it. And all the other studios started to install it. So in, in Sony Studios, we have two, ma two main stages, yeah, the Holden stage and the Novak stage. Yeah. At Fox, we have um, uh, Andy Nelson yeah, uh, has as well at Fox, there are two main stages. At Warner Bros., uh, there is one stage, uh, one big stage, and we have a, a smaller at Richard King. Richard King is uh, one of the top sound designers worldwide in, in, in the top, yeah? He has, I think, three Oscars for best sound design and things like that. Yeah, he's a big fan of our 3D, by the way, yeah? Mm -hmm. Universal, the Hitchcock Theater. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting uh, studios now, yeah? So, <laughs> we have, yeah? so we have all the major studios. They have... Um, they have the auto 3D system there, so they produced a, a lot of movies. Yeah, so I guess there. for me, I don't, I don't care which one's the most popular. I mean, for me personally, I want the best one. Which one sounds the best? Which one sounds the most realistic? And you know, you hope that you know uh, competition brings up the the best one. Whichever one's the best will be the one that succeeds. And that's not always the case. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> look what happened to Betamax. So yeah. <laughs> sometimes sometimes it's just more about uh different types of resources and so to me that's that's a shame i have i have very often that comparison from oh wow is there is this now uh, between dolby atmos and dtsx and 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 auto 3d is this now the same battle that we have with vhx betamax and and and, and uh vh 2000 or was it yeah video 2000 yeah in fact it's not the same mm. you know those were let's say physical this was physical media this is let's say typically let's say what, what this is now this is completely different because we all use now the same physical media we all bring it on a blu-ray disc in a mm -hmm. different way this is more like a different software use and mm -hmm. the capabilities of this technology allows as well for creative creative people different options yeah i think you can better compare it with the windows versus ios from apple versus linux for instance you see mm -hmm. what i mean yeah they're like different approaches and the only problem what i see is that there was not as common speaker layout yeah and because people want to install oh but i if i want to play back atmos i need my speakers to install in the ceiling yeah if it is all it's much easier i do not need that but is it the producing but what well, the good news is that dolby they added the the 30 degree angle yeah, mm -hmm. from Auro in their specs. So if you install Auro with the 30 degree angle, it playbacks Atmos. Okay, okay. Really so, 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 oh, I'm oh, hearing, I'm I'm hearing echo. Echo. Where should, Where I, place should I place my speakers? My speakers? And how should I angle them? There is, a, there is an interesting uh, document which was uh, written by a German guy, yeah. 
I was not, not knowing. I picked it up from uh, from social media. My my marketing people picked it up and said, "Hey, this is an interesting document." Yeah, and that was a person who was like saying, "Okay, hey, I see this standard, and there's the ITU standard, and there's Dolby, and there's like Auto 3D. Is there another way that I can put my speaker so that I can reproduce everything which is still within the specs of all these uh, yeah. things?" That's what I want. Good thing and Michael's not here. It, it, no, no in ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> I can move my speakers at least. Yeah. Uh, no, in fact, it's not necessary. If you put, let's say, if you follow that document, and, and that's typical, if you put those, your height speakers on 30 degrees, you will see that, that um, let's say, you can play back each format very well. And typically, let's say, if you create overhead sounds, yeah, let's say the position, uh, let's say, if you bring the speaker a little bit more to the sides, very often it sounds like better than just over your head. Okay, that so I have like those uh, those SVS elevations with, that have an angle on them. Should I place them on the ceiling or on the wall? I guess that's that's kind of the question. Yeah, the point is, uh, if, the, if, the, if, if by putting them on the wall, it has to do as well with how far you are away from the speakers, yeah? But if you uh, place them on the wall, yeah? Uh, let me put, I, I put in typically up a different rule. I okay. think the distance from your speakers, let's say the height, the height channels or your overhead channels should not become closer to you than the distance from your ear level speaker. I think that's a very interesting one. Okay, hold on. Do you see what I mean? So if you have like, you can put your speakers into the ceiling if you like, but don't put your height speakers or your overhead speakers Closer to yourself than your lower speakers. Mm, okay. Oh man, I gotta move. Uh, so yeah. So so <laughs> if your if your um, front stage is five feet away, just put the put your um, put them right above, right five feet away and above with the thirty degree angle. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think, and that has different reasons because when the height speakers are closer and even with time delays, you might think, okay, we can synchronize them, mm -hmm. but you hear you, uh, our brain picks up there closer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So ah. the best way is that you have your height speakers at least at the same. So you come then to that kind of sphere. All right. All right. And that really makes sense from, if you want to create a natural 3D, uh, natural sound, you have to respect certain things. You have to respect some physical laws there. Yeah. And you, and when you recreate overhead sounds coming closer to yourself, it gives immediately that kind of unnatural feel. That's not the way it works in real life either. Yeah. Don't underestimate that our hearing system is not so sensitive for sounds coming from above. Yeah, it's just always tricky because you think like, oh, maybe maybe you can correct for it by delaying it a certain amount. But it, there's always a, a limitation as far as where the speaker actually is. You can't like, for example, I just moved from a small apartment. Now I have a, a dedicated uh, garage space that I'm using for my theater. And the fact that this I can actually place the speakers further, there's no way I could recreate that w with any type of processing or delays. It The speakers being it's a further physical out, thing. Yeah sounds different you can tell that they're further away and so yeah, i think so that's important our brain is picking this up again uh, the same thing yeah that speaker is like a source and the 3d reflections around it will bring the information to our brain how far that speaker is if you are very blind let's say blind people for instance yeah they are very sensitive for that because they cannot see how far those speakers are yeah mm -hmm. And typically, when when uh, let's say they those people, they like the auto three D format very much because it gives more, let's say, the natural distance that they are used to hear from the total environment. Yeah, and if you put your speakers, let's say, in a in a way, and you have the the right recording of it. It's mm -hmm. amazing how much more depth is creating, and it feels almost like the speakers are disappearing. That's a very interesting topic too. Yeah. A very interesting topic is the following: What I felt is, you remember in the do in those days from surround sound, the big discussion was the front back feeling. It was always like if you have these two discrete channels behind you, a little bit behind you, you felt immediately. Let's say it was that there was not a that. How, in that cinematic feel, you know, in a, in a cinema theater, you have an array of speakers, which is creating that kind of typical, um, let's say, yeah, speaker array, the spread of sound, diffused mm -hmm. field, and it creates much more a kind of an, 
natural spread of diffuse sound. Okay, there are some phase issues in it, but mm -hmm. it's not that much. It's, it's, it's okay, yeah. But you have that natural spread of sound more diffuse, yeah. If you're coming home and you have to you play back the same thing and you hear only two speakers recreating that, you don't have this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now what what I did as well, that's the reason why I came to 7.1 already end of the 90s. I think, yeah, we have to fill that gap. That, that gap between the left or the right speakers the, uh, and the back speakers, that gap is too big. So yeah. fill it up with a speaker. Now, what I found out is that angle is very sensitive for our ears. That speaker was always like the minimum you put in there, you immediately pick it up. Mm -hmm. It has to do with some psycho acoustic things, how things on our on that axis we are very sensitive to that. Yeah? You're talking about sides? Yeah, on the sides, yeah. Mm -hmm. very, uh, let's say on, on direct sides, yeah. Because so, I just I just like I'm saying, I moved actually I told you, Chana, I moved from five point one point four to seven point one, and now I have the side surrounds. Yes. And like they're very obvious. Like I can tell when something's happening like immediately, like, whoa, I didn't I'm yeah. not used to hearing that, you know. And typically what you have in a normal room is your side speakers probably are closer to you as your speakers a little bit further. Mm. That is yeah. a, even if it is time delayed, uh -huh. right, you, you, your brain still picks it up as it's more sensitive. Yeah. Now the good news is the following. Yeah. If you have, let's say, Auto 9.1 installed correctly as, as described, yeah, it gives the feeling that this gap is gone. That typical gap that you have, let's say, between the front and back front feet, stage, yeah, yeah. You have, let's say, an hour nine point one reproduction. You don't miss that 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 gap. Is it feels like it's not there anymore? It was one of my most obvious things when I was doing all this tests in two thousand and five. I said, like, hey man, that gap is almost gone, and the sweet spot is so much larger. Even if you go out of the circle you're sitting in, you still feel that three dimensional thing. It's amazing yeah. how large the sweet yeah. spot. Yeah, and which, and when when he says uh, Oro nine dot one, it's five ear level speakers, four high channels. It's not like seven ear level speakers and two high channels. It's five and then four, um, and then the voice of God or the top layer is the is the ten point one Oro, yeah. and then um, eleven point one is that adding the center height. height? Yeah, center height on the screen. So so with this new uh, Denon receiver, I have. I can go back and forth between that. Either have the center height or the um, the top layer. Which, in your opinion, is better to have? If I only have to do, if I could only do one, which one is better, the voice of uh, God or the top height, uh, center for height? Me, it, for me, it would depend. Let's say on the height of your of your room. Then, if your uh, room eight eight feet eight feet tall, eight feet. Uh, that's two point four meters. <laughs> Perhaps I, I would go then for the third layer, because let's say in, the, the, in, for the Voice of God channel. For the Voice of God channel, yes. Yeah. I think okay. that's. Uh, I think in the important I would do that first because and, and it has to do as well with the size of your screen. If you have like a very big screen, then it might make sense as well. To ah, I see. I see what you're saying. But I would first go for the Voice of God and then the height center. Okay. I remember in the first time we spoke, um, you said that you prefer 9.1 over 10.1. Yeah, I like it. And you know what was, what, when I put that in my video, somebody would, the five paragraphs worth of like, no, he did not say this. And I'm like, no, he told me he, he prefers 9.1 over 10.1. But the guy was like, so like mad. I don't know. He's like, how could the inventor of Oro 3D not like his invention? I'm like, well, it's not about that. No, no, the point is, I have to say, um, we have to, <clears throat> I prefer, if I prefer, let's say, I like the Auto 9.1, especially because it's efficiency, yeah? It's not that I like it more than 10.1, yeah? But I give you an example, yeah? You know, I'm an organist, I'm a classical trained musician as well, yeah? So I played more than 850 concerts, yeah? And um, so what, what happened is when I was recording an organ in a church, yeah? And I came back to the studio, and I was putting it back over my three-layered system. I was putting it back for the way. I was doing it in out of 10.1, by the way. Um, when I was checking the height, the, the center, uh, the, the, let's say the voice of God speaker, yeah, I was a little bit disappointed that the effect of having the voice of God on and off was so small. Hmm. 
I thought in the beginning that something was wrong with my microphone system. I thought, no, 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 I am mean, something. I have something is wrong with my calibration. I do the recording again. So I checked all my microphones, be sure that at least all the levels are right. And then when I think yeah, it, it, it was giving the same result, so the first recording was right already, but then I started to add some volume on the fair, more than acoustically uh, measured, uh, acoustically, uh, acoustically um, how do you call it? Yeah, generated. Yeah, was I was going to uh, higher to increase the volume of the ceiling reproduction to have more of that effect, and it started immediately to sound very unnatural. Mm. And that's because we don't. First of all, human beings are not so sensitive for sounds. We don't have an ear on the top of our head. Yeah, right? and, yeah. and 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 totally, there is. Let's say there is even in an, even in a church yeah, most of the important reflections are coming from the lateral thing between the ear and let's say where our height layer is positioned there's not so much coming from above yeah but let's say what i think is and i think we have to position it right if i have a certain bandwidth available then i would rather to go for our 9.1 with an optimum quality with those 10 channels than adding one channel to have that voice of god channel on top of that it depends, of course, a little bit of the content too. But most of the music content, that is for me not. And I was talking mainly about music when I I said that. Yeah, in music content, I like the Auto Nine Point One a lot because that is very efficient and it is, let's say, the bandwidth that you used is absolutely not much what what it creates. Yeah, if you add, let's say, the Seven Point One or like other things, can you add something from a creative point of view? Yes, you can. It is is it groundbreaking. It depends perhaps on the kind of content, yeah. But that's something that content creators can decide. If they like for certain reasons to to use an order 13.1 for their thing, then they use it. And of course, let's say if people don't have the order 13.1 all on or 9.1 only at playback, it will be damn close, let say, to the intent that they want that they had, which is completely different if you have let's say formats that they have only two high speakers. Oh yeah. Oh that's yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, no, with Atmos, I know moving from f from two high channels to four and watching the same Atmos demo, I noticed that um, the rear speakers have play three roles. The rear speakers will be your surround back, your surrounds, and your rear heights if yeah. you don't have them. So yeah. the sound, like, so like a plane flying over goes zoom, like right behind your head. And, um, <laughs> because because you don't have that second rear height and that's one of the things that's just kind of like it it occurred to me that um if the person is mixing um an atmos track in a room that's 7.1.4 it's better for you as the consumer the end user to also have 7.1.4 to get an accurate representation otherwise you're you know i had i had 5.1.2 so all those movies i watched some weird stuff was happening because the surrounds are playing surrounds. Um, it's playing surround backs and they're playing rear heights. Mm -hmm. So it's very odd. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think the speaker layout is a very important thing. Um, and the content, of course, is, is important too. But let's say we have a lot of content out. We have more than, we are about 100 music albums, more than 1,400 titles already out in music. Yeah. So we are leading in music. And uh, the Grammy Awards as well, were, uh, like the recent Grammy Awards were won by productions which are based on our 3D. Yeah? Um, and movies, there will come more movies, streaming is coming. But like in China, we are selected for to become the, the new uh, standard as well in China, our 3D as speaker layout is there, the basic as well. The speaker layout that I designed became, in fact, a standard in ITU. Yeah? And um, and there is some flexibility, of course, to be sure. Let's say all speaker layouts are in this kind of same, let's say, standard, yeah, which is which is the case. Yeah. So, how do we yeah. get to listen to RO three D music? Like, what? How? How? How would I do that if I wanted to do that right now? Uh, you can you can ask me to send you the demo disc, and there's a ton of music on there. I mean, <laughs> but like, what if I want to listen to my, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. Are you planning on doing any kind of streaming through? Any kind of music streaming, like it's Tidal coming. or Kobas, it's coming. Is it's it? Coming, yeah. But I cannot tell too much. Oh, okay. About it. All right. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, that's all that's right. a start. Yeah. 
Yes. Hey, I don't want to keep you too long. I mean, I could go on for days. Like I'm saying, I had a question about, uh, I saw uh, Amar Bose. He did this uh, one presentation. I, I saw like he had his class there and he told the person to close their eyes and he jingled some keys like in front of them here. And then he yeah. jingled them above them. And then they said, all right, where, where were they before and where are they now? And they were able to place it. And then he did another one, I think, where he did it just above. And so there was no reference point as to whether it was here and then there. So I'm wondering how much of the height experience is the difference. Like you understanding this is where it was and then that's where it went. Yeah. Um, yes. You know. Yes. A lot of the, the, there's a very interesting test, by the way. Yeah. Uh, our brain is uh, very sensitive in, let's say, these time differences. Mm -hmm. yeah? And to give you an idea, yeah, um, there's, a, there's a very interesting topic as well to talk about perhaps in, an, in, an, in, another, uh, in another conference. Yeah? Is, let's say, um, a lot of people are talking about high-resolution audio. Yeah? Now, they, love, they love you. They're like, keep them talking, Joe. Keep them talking. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I give master classes, but they take three days, yeah? Yes, <laughs> I believe it. Only so, three days? I have my water. It's all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, but let's say high resolution audio is not a misunderstanding by a lot of marketing, which is not right. Yeah. Uh, they make people believe that 24 bit is suddenly creating the high resolution audio. Yeah. And let's say I tell it is not about the amount of bits is not the most important one. If you're going above 18 bits, there is almost no difference that you can experience anymore. And that has to do with our way of hearing. Yeah. Let me come later to that point. Yeah. Most important is the frequencies. Yeah. So uh, if you go up to 96 kilohertz or 192, that's much more important. And people say then, but hey, we don't hear above 20 kilohertz. So why would we uh, reproduce 96 kilohertz? What's in there about 96 kilohertz? And it is not so much about, uh, uh, let's say, the frequency. It's about the time information. Yeah, there is something very interesting. Is the following? Yeah, when when uh, sound comes on our ears, that goes to the cortex, that takes only four to five millionth of a second, so five microseconds. Five microseconds is the same wavelength as a two hundred kilohertz sample. So human beings are capable to have, let's say, up to about 200 kilohertz time information. So spatial information, that's how sensitive our brain system is. Yeah. So when, when and the timing is a very important thing. You know, when a dog is not knowing where the sounds come from, the first thing what he does is he, he, he just... And that's what you do as well. If you're not aware about where something comes from, you just let's say that one millisecond of change of information gives our three-dimensional brain, if I, uh, let's say, analyzing the, the three-dimensional sound from our brain, enough information to know exactly where it is. Yeah. Now, we are, as I told you, Joe, we are, let's say, not so sensitive as sounds coming from both. We don't have an ear here, yeah? Because if that would be the case, that key would be immediately picked up as close as by there, yeah? This is a this is a different this let's say all this axis in between is the most mm. difficult part to reproduce yeah and the the moment when when sound is moving a little bit then it is much more easier to find where it is mm. I think <clears throat> if you hear like for instance sound which is binauralized all this binaural demos they're all about the same. Because it's all about moving sounds. Because then in a headphone, you have with tricks, the tricks that you use with moving sounds, you can reproduce that better. When the sounds are static, it's much more difficult for our brains to pick up where all these things are coming from. Yeah, right. But it's really true what you just said. Let's say the moment when you, you when you lose that reference, that's something which is. Uh, what is it? Ask you, Lisa. When he Third. On that. I tell you what, um, it was my goal by the end of this year, yeah, uh, we, because we are we are celebrating this year our 10th year anniversary. R2D came to the market in October 2010. 10 October 2010, by the way. Yeah, that's the moment when I launched the official format and everything. In. So the celebration year ends in October this year, yeah. But we are not ready yet. There's a lot of things that we are working on at this moment. So I hope by the end of the year, perhaps under your Christmas tree this year, there, there would be, let's say, a new 
three 3D demo disc. Yeah. So nice. Uh, Did we answer this one, Chana? How hard oh, yeah, is it to bring it's streaming too- formats like Netflix and Disney Plus? Yeah, the point is, of course, um, the streaming technology we have now, yeah, I think uh, might take a little bit too much data for what I used to have, to used to have, yeah. But let's say the streaming technology that we are releasing, uh, let's say in the upcoming period, yeah, that's something else. But the decisions that such companies have to make are, let's say, it's much more just. It's not so. There's a lot of things that we have to do, let's say, to be sure that like in the reproduction field everywhere yeah but i know there's a huge interest from the market already so i cannot tell that they are yeah. interested to do it but there's a lot of interest coming up because what you feel is in the last 10 years there was a huge evolution in the quality of the picture yeah we went from yeah. to high definition now to 4k but the better the picture quality is the more you feel that the sound is not matching that that picture quality and I have a very interesting things, yeah. Uh, I remember, and that's very interesting. That I learned a lot about those tests, yeah. I was trying in the following thing. I was trying 4K picture with surround sound versus 2K picture, but then with other 3D. Mm. What is giving the best result? So if you improve your picture quality and you take just surround sound, 7.1, or you use 2K quality, so a lesser video quality, and you use auto 3D. So, and so you're, course, yeah, so you're basically kind of supplementing. Yeah. You're, 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 you're kind of trading off the bandwidth, right? You're going from 4K to 2K video wise, so that you can put the auto 3D in. Yeah. I, you sure. know, chances are with the way that uh, a lot of these TVs upscale these days, I don't think anybody would notice a difference. Let me guess, you like the 4K one better? I tell you what, <laughs> I just I tell you what, I'm going to give you the result because Barco did a lot of tests. You know, our our partner Barco, if let's say they are leading worldwide in, in cinema projectors, about 50% of the cinemas worldwide have a Barco projector. Yeah. So and we were doing tests on all these things, and in Galaxy as well, we have that 4K Barco projector that we can switch easy between 2K and 4K with the tests. Yeah. Now the funny result is the following. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We said to people, you have to say what you choose, what you like most as an overall experience. Yeah, And we could guess, of course, the 3D sound was going to the one being chosen. But we asked the people why they chose it. And they chose for the 2K plus Auro. And the reason why they said is, oh, because that was having the best picture quality. Mm. That was interesting. Yeah. They said, okay, and they were thinking was they go there were people from the visual field there as well. They could they thought, oh wow, this is this is better. And the point is if the sound is and we took of course good sound stuff as well, but the sound brings you in this kind of belief and it enhances that total immersive experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was watching recently a football where we were like having the European Championship here now, yeah. Even the World Championship football was already completely done in our 3D as a test case, yeah, where we did a lot of tests, yeah. Uh, the the New Year's event, uh, the biggest uh, classical, uh, you know, the New Year's concert in Vienna, yeah, that's already seven years now in our 3D. There are a lot of events already recorded in our 3D format, mm. but they are not streamed yet. Uh, with the with the New Year's concert, they put it on a Blu-ray disc, which is not the case with the World Cup, of course, of the Football Cup, yeah. But um, let's say there's a lot of tests going on, and it is amazing, yeah. When you hear sports, it feels like you're in that stadium. It feels like you're there. It's, it's, it's. it's I believe it. In the he's crowd. right. It, yeah. what, he's right. But the the guy who said Euro 3D, I'm not getting. Yeah. All, where's all the stuff over here? I feel like I'm missing <laughs> out now. <laughs> I told you, man. I told I'm missing you. out. What the hell? Oh, yeah. The point boy. is, of course, let's say let's try to inform the people who are interested where you can get our content, yeah, and to discover a little bit more about it. More will come over the years, yeah. But yeah. I think a very interesting technology that uh, we developed is uh, automatic, yeah. It, the, because in the beginning, when people have this setup, uh, I was thinking, uh, yeah, probably people will not have enough content because in the beginning, it's very typical that chicken and egg stuff. You remember yeah. when you had a HD television, like all the programs were not on HD. It, 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 it takes a while. It takes like a few mm-hmm. years. Yeah. And I think at this moment, the market is really ready. Now you see 
uh, immersive sound is almost now in all those standards and most of the manufacturers they are starting to implement it uh, with virtual technology and all the kind of stuff so i think in the next five years it's coming along yeah and there will be much more content native content coming yeah but so what i tried is to create an, a technology that converts in real time from stereo up to an r3 experience i want that yeah and i tell you what you will be surprised because a lot of content yeah um is let's say even not created in in, in immersive sound sounds huge uh, and and sounds so much more emotional yeah i have a few friends and there's a new trend coming up as well i see more and more they like their old vinyl re records uh -huh. and what they do is they put their vinyl record on put them in the ev receiver mix it up to r 3 d and they hear their vinyl in a three-dimensional sound field Whoa. why not hey i didn't even think about Can that that sounds I cool examples from it i was shocked myself i said wow <laughs> can you this, call can you also call a nad and tell them to put oro what's going on i have i have an nad t778 i have to switch back to the, my denon to get to get my oro what's going yes, on automatic is something you really have to check out because people at this moment they put only that format up yeah and uh and it is, it's, it may sometimes even compare native stuff from, let's say, from our competitors compared to just 5.1 and up mixed, yeah? And it gives, let's say, it's, it just gives, let's say, automatic gives that a very natural, immersive effect, yeah? yeah. And, uh, of course, if it is native, you can position the sounds discrete and things. But the, the I developed that with Ralph Kessler that, that, that together, and we worked seven years just See? on fine-tuning the parameters yeah because they're like 54 parameters which are real in real time analyzing the sound field yeah and up till now there was not even one music song or movie that i think let's say i would say okay give me the original one because the original is better i always feel the addition and the transparency it extra creates what you're used to hear from a two-dimensional thing starts even from stereo wow. if you if you use up mixing, yeah, you will feel how much more detail you will get even from all those instruments inside in the recording. Oh man, and, he, yeah, he's telling me like, I need to get Dirac plus Oro audio. Oh, so I need to get audio control. I need to ditch the T778 and get the audio control mm -hmm. with Oro. <laughs> audio control, Maestro X9. There you uh, go, dude. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, so right. we have this uh, after show that we do where people that are watching can ask you questions. Just the way we're talking here. Like in a so video. So if you chat. have a little more energy, I mean, look, see, my wife just delivered my oh. my lunch here. So if you have a, a minute and just to answer some questions over there, I left a link here in the private chat. You know what? I'm I'm not even joking. If you can come back next time and talk in more detail, all all these people here are interested in hearing more information. I mean, yeah. lots of questions. Lots of questions. Is off the show also for me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if okay. you can, uh, on the private chat here, yeah, I left yeah, the on link. The right. and also, Chana, uh, you might want to mention about our Patreon. That's a, Oh, that's yeah, that's right. Hey, what's all right, everybody. If you guys want to go to the after show, uh, go to patreon.com slash daily hi-fi, sign up, and you will get the link to go to the after show, which happens right as we close this off. Um, and looks like looks like everybody wants you to come back, Wilfried. <laughs> I think... Uh, is it some sleepless, uh, what is it, Monday please nights? Please come back, pretty please. <laughs> Let's come back and perhaps we have to bring a few people like, they're like people that are very knowledgeable as well, which you know a lot about the consumer market, even much more than myself. Like Patrick Shepard from Groby, he has a lot of interesting videos where he's talking to people. So if you find, they're like a few channels and things like that, where you can have a lot of information. Uh, so I think, and, and I'm happy to share what I can. So I will make a PowerPoint that you can share with the people who are, let's say, following this course and that you can give interesting information to all of them, okay? Yes, Yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, thank you to everyone that, that came and watched. Um, we will see you guys next week. And for those that are patrons, um, we'll see you in the after show in just a few minutes. Again, it's uh, patreon.com slash daily hi-fi if you guys want to get access, because it's all about that access. Uh, on behalf of myself and Joe, and uh, we want to thank you, uh, Wilfried, for for hanging out with us. Don't um, leave. Don't leave. 
Yeah, Don't do not hit that leave studio button, okay? <laughs> okay? Do not hit that button. Um, we're just ending this uh, for right now, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.